is Johnny Ashi, and I'm from the group Arab Americans for Syria. I want to thank you for asking me to come here today, tonight and speak with you. Um, we started the group about two and a half years ago when we realized that what we are up against. We knew that this war is a, a media war before it's uh, anything else. Uh, to win this war, we need to win the media war before we win the ground war. We started Arab Americans for Syria doing events like this, trying to educate the public and, uh, of course, trying to appear on as much media outlets as we can. Um, two and a half years ago, when we spoke or we wore this flag or we mentioned the name Bashar Assad, people would boo us. Um, people would look at us like, what kind of a dictator are you? What kind of a Nazi fascist are you for you know, supporting a dictatorship? And when I asked them, what do you know? How do you know about what is happening in Syria? He goes, the, the, the images don't lie. Well, I have something to tell you tonight. Hopefully, uh, before the end of my 15 minute session, I can prove to you that everything you have seen or heard about Syria was not just exaggerated, nor was it biased. It was a total fabrication. And this is what uh, CNN, Al Jazeera, and Al Arabiya have made us believe. Al Jazeera and Al Arabiya on the Arabic um, you know, market or the Middle Eastern markets, uh, they're belonging to Saudi Arabia and Qatar. Not so the most democratic countries, as you know. Uh, they are the most actually reactionary countries in the Middle East. So when you get the news from a country that does not have any freedom or any democracy in its own country, you shouldn't go ahead and just believe everything you see or hear. Um, Saudi Arabia and Qatar obviously are the two countries who have funded about six or seven billion dollars between the two of them to the insurgency in Syria. This is not my own. Everything I'm going to tell you tonight, it's facts. You can Google it, and it's from Western media. So you will hear everything I say today from mainstream media. I'm not bringing anything from uh, my sources. Uh, Saudi Arabia and, uh, and Qatar, represented by Al Arabiya and Al Jazeera, blew up the, the, the crisis in Syria from day one. I can tell you, um, a lot of, of, of you tonight asked me to go on the chronological order of the event and how it all started. I would rather you know, mention it um, as I go along. I really want to start from today and go backward if we can, and whatever time I'm allowed. But Al Arabiya and Al Jazeera started on day one, uh, you know, and the events in Dara. The events in Dara was just it could have been a piece of news, no different than any other piece of news that day. It, we could have heard about it and it would have been over. I can tell you on March 18, when of course there were 10 kids who were arrested uh, for writing graffiti on the walls. People in Dara went and protested. And, um, you know, the governor of Dara, who was very loved, by the way, um, in the last 10 years, Dara has actually received the most money in Syria. And it was, uh, you know, uh, there was no reason for, uh, you know, an outrage or an all-out revolution to start from Dara. They went and asked for these 10 kids. I can tell you, it reminded me of what happened with Rodney King. Um, here's something that was, was not blown out of proportion. Rodney King, verdict. The, the cops, the white cops, were actually found not guilty. There was some riots that took place and, and, and what? We heard 24 hours later, 50 men were killed and the riot was over. The media could have played that and what happened in what? And exploded it and turned it into an out war, an all out war in the United States. It could have said, white cops killing 50 unarmed black men. And you would have had, and if you would incite that, just that thought, and repeat it over and over and over again, you could have had militants carry arms in every little town and every big city in the United States, and we would have had probably a civil war by now. So it's how you play the event, and why do you em emphasize certain points and not the others. The two men who were killed that day in March 18 in Dara, the Syrian government, Bashar Assad himself, sent two ministers from Damascus, the two ministers from Dara who were represented in the government, attended the funeral of the two men, who we don't know how they were killed, by the way. There was a big commotion, okay, thousands of people, the governor was in the street, and then he was, you know, mobbed, and, you know, stones were thrown, whatever. Two people were killed. It reminded me of what happened in Kyiv, um, you know, in February 20th, when we saw protesters die and policemen died at the same time. 
And of course, the West immediately blamed the president at that time for, for that right. And then just today, I saw a video on a German TV showing you how the snipers were coming from the back, were not from the government building in the front, but from a Kiev hotel from the back. Those same snipers who killed the protesters and who killed the, uh, the government forces. So, in that day, there was no investigation was to take place. The media played over and over and over how unarmed protesters were killed by government forces. The truth, we will never know what happened that day, but it could have been downplayed. Um, a lot of stories have been downplayed. The, the riots in France were downplayed five, six years ago when un the unemployed were burning cars. It was put a lid on it. The, the most I can remind, uh, tell you about is the Bahrain Revolution. It's one of the most peaceful revolution in the history of mankind, in my opinion, where hundreds of thousands who can, did not come out from the mosques, they come from universities and from their clinics and from the, the factories, and went and it was honestly the most peaceful. You don't see an image of one Bahraini carrying a stick. I can show you images from the first month of the, of the protests in Syria where people were carrying swords and screaming and wanting to behead the infidel. But in Bahrain, it was put a lid on it. They were till now, right now, we have doctors who are imprisoned still today for treating the injured on this uh, um, protest. So when we want to blow up a story, we can make uh, a story appear to be so much different than what it really is. Obviously, Syria was, as we heard was declared, on the <laughs> list of government to be tossed. We, we don't like the Syrian government here in the United States, obviously, because they support the Palestinian resistance and the Lebanese resistance, and that's a big no-no. The French foreign ex-foreign minister, uh, I heard them speak right now, he was asked if he would join in toppling the Syrian government because of its stance against uh, you know, imperialism. So we have no doubt, no secret, that Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and all the countries involved in the war in Syria do want to topple the Syrian government. The Bahrain government, however, we don't want to topple it because it's a friend, it's not an enemy. Um, we fast forward uh, to um, the lies. Again, it is fabricated lies. We saw videos from the early on in the march. And I would visit Syria. I was in April of 2011 there in Syria. We saw images on TV, we didn't ask him. Everybody's calling everybody, what are these images happening? Um, it's easy to concentrate on a few protests, a few hundred people. Now the truth in Syria, that hundreds of thousands of people were going out in protest, but in pro-protest, in support of the government. Millions of people would come out every weekend and support. We've never seen those images. And these people were not forced to come out. I would be sitting on my balcony and we see people coming with the Syrian flags thrown on their faces and they have their kids and they're all going to the square to, to, to support the reform program that Bashar Assad was talking about. To support the media and, and Syrian media, which is the responsible media for not showing what small event might have happened, but show the whole picture. Al Jazeera Arabia insisted to show the smaller picture, insisted to show the 500 people who were protesting. So the first lie, I'm going to go through about 10 big lies that the media, which I blame for everything that happened in Syria, honestly. The first lie I would want to talk about is that the government or Bashar Assad is killing his own people. How many people have heard this? We still hear this today, that Bashar Assad has killed 150,000 people. And I ask him, how? What's your evidence of, oh, the government is killing its own people? That lie was never explained. All you had to do is ask yourself, what is, what is the evidence? Show me one Syrian soldier aiming at a peaceful protester. Until today, they cannot show me this. I have a video that I will show you on April 2011. April, meaning less than a month, when this whole thing started. They're shooting an unarmed policeman. There were a presidential decree from the first week on for the policemen to protect the protesters and they cannot be carrying arms. And two weekends in a row, we lost 22 Syrian policemen in Homs. Unarmed, you will see them running and you see the snipers heading at their heads and they're dropping like flies. This, what the Syrian army, what the Syrian, that's why the Syrian army got involved. Because we do not have what we call riot control police. We don't have the riot control gears. The second lie was done is that all these protests that the Al Jazeera was telling us about, every single Friday they'll tell you there was 425 points of protest. The next week would be 460 points of protest. But they're trying to tell you that the whole Syrian population is out, is protesting. They tell you 500 points of protest. 
and they show you 50 people, 100 people peacefully protesting. Yes, jumping, singing, dancing. You don't see any army around them. You don't see any policemen around them because there was, a, a, again, another uh, decree from the president and from the government of Syria. Leave them alone. However, Al Jazeera had this satellite communication and you see people start running suddenly. We don't see images of any policemen or army. All you see is a shaking camera and, and people running and you hear the sound of a gun and you can tell this, the gun is coming from next to the guy who's filming, okay? And um, you see some blood on the ground and you don't see really any evidence of that. So the 500 or the 600 point of protest we were asking, where are these people? You were here 600 point of protest, then they tell you four people died in homes. What about all these peaceful protests, the 600? If the government killed one peaceful protest per protest, there should be 600 people killed. Why only four in Homs? Because Homs, everybody knew they had armed and they were not peaceful. From day one, they barricaded themselves and they started you know, receiving arms from Lebanon and from other areas. The third lies that Al Jazeera and Arabia really played for over a year and a year and a half almost is that to justify the death of the Syrian policemen, the Syrian security forces, the Syrian army men, what would they say? If a policeman killed, they would tell you, he was killed by other policemen for refusing to shoot at peaceful protesters. That's the lie they kept telling people over and over and over again and repeating. And people would believe it. Now, I'm a policeman, I have people I've worked with, I tell them, shoot at um, um. I mean, what? What kind of a government would ask their policemen to shoot at unarmed policemen or unarmed protesters? So every time a policeman was killed, they would tell you he killed his people killed him. So they would justify the death of policemen and the army. They justify the death of the army men is that they were trying to defect. They were trying to leave the army and go join the rebels. And they were caught, so they were killed and shot in the back. I'm going to tell you, we wouldn't know. I would ask people in the army, all, you know, the Syrian army is composed of every Syrian. Every family has their children in the army. It's mandatory to serve. It's not a militia like some of these jihadists are. So we ask people, are these really people defecting? Because on Al Jazeera, every week a thousand people defected. By the end of the year, we had like a quarter million people defected. The Syrian army is not even made up of more than 250, 300,000. So all these defections, where did they go? An event on April 10, 2000, uh, April 10, 2011, we heard on Al Jazeera that 11 army men were killed trying to defect. I met a father of one of these soldiers, a martyr. Um, those 11, we did not know how they said they were trying to defect and they were killed. We didn't have any videos. Three months later, the, the, the terrorists, rebels, whatever you want to call them, themselves released a video of what happened to these 11 men. They were in a bus going on their vacation. That's before the army yet entered. We're talking about April 10, 2011. They were ambushed by terrorist rebels and there was a shootout and it lasted for about two hours. All 11 men were killed, one of them was in general. The father of that dead soldier told me, I'm not upset that my son died. I was so upset that Al Jazeera put him as a, deflect, as a defector. He lost his honor. They would put pictures of these men who were fighting for the Syrian army as defectors and they were killed by other army men. They dishonored our soldiers. They've done this, they kept on doing it for a year, year and a half. Hundreds of, 200 at least, of religious Salafi Wahhabis satellite, you know, chants feeding hate 24 hours for the rest of the world. Of course we're gonna have to build jihadists. They brought in all these jihadists because like you heard this American guy, American man said, why did you go? Because, because I couldn't bear seeing all these pictures of all these dead people that have Bashar Assad killed. So he went and joined the Al-Qaeda. So that was a big lie about that we justify the killing of all the policemen that died in early on as they were defectors or they refused to shoot at unarmed. Uh, protesters. The number one lies is that the United States continue to tell us that we're arming the moderate rebels in Syria. That's my favorite. Yeah. Arming the moderate rebels. I've been asking for two and a half years for anyone to show me any footage of a moderate rebel. Point out one moderate rebel. Oh, they tell you the Syrian, free Syrian army are one moderate rebel. Well, guess who Abu Saqqar is? Have anyone seen a video of a, of, of a rebel or a terrorist man killing a Syrian soldier 
then cutting his chest open and getting out his heart and his lung and ate it on TV. They videotaped that. This Abu Sakkar, who had appeared on Al Jazeera many times as a moderate trouble, these are the moderate troubles the United States want to support. Or at one point it was Nusra Front because they were fighting the more aggressive or the more you know radical ISIS. You know, so we have more moderate because the other ones are most are more radical. So we call these moderate. There is no moderate troubles in Syria. I assure you, everyone who has carried an arm and have killed Syrian soldiers or or, or shot and and, 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 and rockets, uh, propelled grenade on pure civilians, just like it's been happening for a year and a half in Damascus. These rebels who the United States consider to be armed, to consider to be moderate, because the ones around Damascus, they're all considered to be moderate. They have been launching rockets, propelled grenades on civilians randomly. This is alone by itself. If we would put this in the media every day, Dozens of Syrians are dying. The, uh, just a few days ago, 50 children were hurt and one of them was killed when a rocket randomly hit their bus. So we're looking, we're talking about civilians being attacked by those moderate rebels. And the United States is trying to justify that. Um, the fifth one is the massacre that we've heard about early on in the first year. You all heard about the Hula massacre. Okay, where we saw pictures suddenly on Al Jazeera, we saw pictures of children and women lying and they're killed. And the United States immediately condemned the Syrian government responsible and the Syrian army responsible for the killing of these kids and women. We want to see evidence. Uh, by the way, on that next morning, the, all the Western embassies closed their embassies in Damascus. So the condemnation was there. Now, of course, when the proof come out, and proved to be actually it was the radical groups who killed all these women and children. That these women and children belong to certain sect, not the others. Nobody would hear about the explanation. When that video I was telling you about earlier about the bus ambush, Al Jazeera did not apologize, did not show that video. On the contrary, they hid it and they continued to show whatever footage they can show to escalate, to further fuel the conflict in Syria. The chemical attack on Huta and before it in Khan al Assad. Dr. Bashar Jafari in November 2012 gave two letters to Ban Ki-moon and to the Security Council indicating that video that you saw when they, you know, they were trying to uh, put the chemical bomb on them. There was evidence that the, these people were getting the sarin gas. He gave them actual evidence. It was blown out. And in Khan al Assad on March 19, that happened. We requested a probe in that. Never happened. On the 20th of August, finally, the UN team came to investigate what happened in Khan Asad. On the 21st, the very next day, the Huta chemical attack. Everybody blamed the Syrian government. We were going to go to war. And I want to thank you guys for stopping that war from happening. It wasn't what, Bush, what Obama talked about in his speech of the Union address, that the might of the uh, American army is what prevented Assad or, um, you know, stopped Assad from using further chemical. No, you guys prevented that war from happening by contacting your congressman and telling them, no, we need more evidence. And of course, evidence was surfacing at the time that was the rebels who used the chemical and not the Syrian government. Uh, Seymour Hersh, we heard right now what he said. NATO member Turkey is responsible for the attack on Wuta. Has this made news, did, it, did this main, mainstream media, this alone should be a, you know, a major piece of news. No, only we hear it on progressive media. He has evidence that Turkey, NATO member, was behind the Khan Asad, behind the Luta attack. Uh, another line that we heard that the CIA is not involved in the war. It does not arm anything. The CIA, and I can tell you, you can Google it, on Western media, I'm talking about independent, the, 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 the Telegraph, the British Telegraph, have talked about Thousands, tens of thousands of pounds of arms, of heavy artillery have come from Benghazi. All the weapons that they seized in Libya were sent from Benghazi to Turkey and, and to the Syrian rebels. 100 plus aircraft, cargo airplanes left Zagreb airport in Yugoslavia into Ankara or into Amman, Jordan. And all these heavy artillery that you see in Syria, where did they come from? You see a, a war going on between two parties. Okay, we know the Syrian army, where is he getting his weapons from? Where are these heavy artillery that these rebels have? Where are they coming from? Do you think a bug can enter the Turkish border or the Jordanian border without the, the, the CIA's um, you know, approval? 
No, the CIA is behind funding and, and sending weapons to the rebels from day one, um, and not just moderate, all kind. Um, the, the ninth why, and that's my, you know another favorite of mine, that we have been told, and we still are told today, that radical Islam terror groups pose the greatest threat to our peace and our security here in the United States, and that we need to have relentless war on terror against them. Right? That's how we justify it. The budget defense, it's one of the, not the, one of the largest, the defense, U.S. defense budget is bigger than the whole entire world defense budget combined. And the reason we can justify that because we have a war on terror. Obama today still justified the Afghan after 13 years, this is the U.S. longest war by the way, after 13 years he can still justify why we still have U.S. troops in Afghanistan because we're fighting a war on terror. We give up our civil liberties after 9-11 because we're fighting a war on terror, right? With the homeland security, and we know what they do. Uh, we lost 3,000 lives in, in, in uh, the, the towers, and we have lost over 5,000 American soldiers in, in Iraq, all because we are fighting a war on terror. And we took all that because we want to keep America safe. Well, guess what? The biggest lie is that in Syria, our leaders and our Obama administration have been siding with these same radical groups belonging to Al-Qaeda and to Nusra Front and to ISIS against the Syrian government. So against what? A secular government that protects the right of all Syrians. We're, we're siding with the terrorists who have been funded by the Saudis who have no right, no, no respect for human rights. They don't have, uh, women cannot drive in Saudi Arabia. A thief can have his hand cut. A gay man can be executed. This is the Saudi Arabia that the United States is supporting against a secular Syria. Uh, finally, number 10, and that's the biggest lie of all, and this is I just read today, and it's really interesting. It's going to show the proof of everything I just talked about. Um, you can look at this up. It's gonna, you're going to hear it all over. It's just been released. Council on Foreign Relations released today, uh, and this is from the Syrian Observatory of Human Rights. For those of you who don't know who the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, it's an opposition group, okay? So this is not a pro-government group, okay? They've been keeping stats. I don't know how they've been keeping it, but the United Nations and the rest of the world take their numbers very, very seriously. Today, we have seen in their report that most of the reported deaths in Syria have not been committed by forces under Bashar Assad. What is that telling us? The 150,000 people that they're saying Bashar Assad has killed or the Syrian government had killed, the majority of them were not committed, those deaths were not committed by president or by the government forces. Actually, I have some chilling numbers for you. Chilling numbers, and it was chilling for me as well. I didn't believe these numbers were that high. The total civilians were 51,000. Now, guess part of what total civilians were. There were 5,000 women, 7,900 children, 13,000 men and women. So there was 25,000 missing. They have rebel forces, part of the civilians. This is an opposition group, guys. This is a, a, the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights. Talking that 24,275 rebel forces are part of those total civilians. So when we've been saying from day one that the Syrian army is going under attack, the security forces are being ambushed and slaughtered and, and bodies mutilated. You say, no, 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 you're dreaming. These, these people are killing civilians. So they have 24,000. So the rest of the t civilians are 25,000. 25,000 from 150, it's a huge number. But you know what? In most wars, people thought that 90% of casualties are civilians. This is the first war that shows only 25,000 out of 150,000 were only civilians. Now, now of that 25,000, how many do you think were civilians were killed by the terrorists for being pro-Assad? I can tell you a few thousand minimum. We know the names of a few thousand who have been slaughtered for being pro-Syria or pro-government. So maybe the rest of these were in the crossfire. We're not saying that, that there was no civilian losses life. A lot of civilian losses life, but to understand that only 2,200 were forces that were defectors from the Syrian army. So it's not in the hundreds of thousands. 2,000 versus 25,000 of rebel fighters who were not in the army, who took arms against the Syrian army. Foreign combatants, and I know this number is wrong. Again, this could be very biased against the Syrian government. 
you know, from the source of what is 11,000 foreign combatants. We know the Syrian army have talked about and Syrian government can prove of at least 20,000. So think of foreign combatants, 20,000 versus 24,000 Syrian rebels. This revolution is so not Syrian that they had to bring 100,000 foreign fighters and 20,000 of them were killed in Syria. And then they tell you it's the revolution of Assad by the Syrian people, that the Syrian opposition have entered Qasab. Not one of these people who have entered Qasab is Syrian. They all entered from the borderline, from under the wash eyes of the Turkish border patrol. That's the only entrance into Qasab. They all entered there and they were all Chechens and Afghans and Libyan and Saudis. When Al Jazeera showed the report two weeks ago, they had to translate what the leader of the group was saying because he was speaking in Chechnya. He was not Syrian. And they were writing underneath, the Syrian oppositions have entered Qasab and freed Qasab. Freed Qasab from its people. You know? So foreign fighters go into Syria and they free. And this Jazeera is saying, these are the heroes. Okay? So again, um, I don't want to take too much of your time, but if I can go down the pro-regime on that number, that's what's sad. And this is by, again, the Observatory of Human Rights, City Observatory. 57,500 pro-regime fighters. 57,000 men of the Syrian army and security forces and policemen lost their lives in this war. How is that a one-sided fight? If the Syrian army wanted to kill civilians, he would kill 150,000 without losing one man. The Syrian army is paying a very, very heavy price because he is so careful of human lives, of civilians who might be caught in the crossfire. That's why Homs, the army, didn't enter until a year and a half later when it got really bad. That's why he didn't enter Daraya and he still doesn't enter Jobar and in many of these areas because of the civilians. He wants to assure, rescue, make sure the secure release of the civilians or evacuation of civilians before he enters. 57,000. This is by the Human Rights Observatory, Syrian Human Rights Observatory. So the 150,000, we can see that the majority of these people were killed, were pro-government and not, um, you know, rebels or civilians that were being told. I want to thank you for having me here. Um, I will be here for the Q&A. There's a lot of points that we can discuss or talk about. But again, thank you so much for listening. Appreciate it. experience in this, you have been in Syria a few times, you have seen the situation uh, closely and every word that you said ex expressed the truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Um, my presentation uh, is taken from Ron Paul Institute's uh, archives. As you know, Ron Paul is maybe the only real uh, Republican former uh, presidential candidate who tells the truth and nothing but the truth and, uh, and I'm going to read some of the articles that were published in, uh, in his uh, uh, organization's website and so uh, thank you for listening and thank you for coming by the way. The U.S. and allies ignited the anti-Assad uprising in 2011 using the underground Syrian Muslim Brotherhood and imported jihadis. Most of the uprising against Damascus began on the borders with Lebanon and Jordan, from where US, British, French, and Saudi intelligence services organized and trained and financed anti-Assad groups. Turkish intelligence also fueled the uprising in the north. But Assad's forces, with some limited help from Russia, Iran, and Lebanon's Hezbollah, held on and are now beating the U.S.-backed rebels. During the long, bloody Iran-Iraq war in 90, from 1980 to 1988, the U.S., Britain, Italy, and Germany exported chemical weapons, plants, and raw material raw material to Iraq, 
that produce sarin nerve gas and burning mustard gas. Many thousands of Iranian soldiers were killed, horribly burned, and blinded by these Western supplied weapons. The war criminals in Washington and other Western capitals were determined to, ma to maintain their lie that the Syrian government used chemical weapons in August 2013. The US and UK governments have revealed none of the conclusive evidence they claim to have that the Syrian government used chemical weapons. Indeed, one reason for the rush to war was to prevent the UN inspection that Washington knows would it disprove its claim and possibly implicate Washington in the false flag attack by the rebels who assembled a large number of children into one area to be chemically murdered with the blame pinned by Washington on the Syrian government. Once again, Washington has preempted any hope of peaceful settlement. By announcing the forthcoming attack, the U.S. destroyed any incentive for the rebels to participate in the peace talks with the Syrian government. On the verge of these talks taking place, the rebels never have no incentive to participate and the West's military is coming to their end, to their aid. In his press conference, uh, Lavrov, who is the foreign minister of Russia, spoke of how the ruling parties in the US, UK, and France stir up emotions among poorly informed people that, once aroused, have to be satisfied by war. This, of course, is the way the U.S. manipulated the public in order to attack Afghanistan and Iraq. But the American public is tired of the wars, the goal of which is never made clear, and has grown suspicious of the government's justifications for more wars. As former President Jimmy Carter recently stated, America has no functioning democracy. It has a police state in which the executive branch has placed itself above all law and the Constitution. The forthcoming Western attack on Syria has nothing whatsoever to do with bringing freedom and democracy to Syria. And any more than freedom and democracy were reasons for the attacks on Iraq and Libya, neither of which gained any freedom and democracy. The Western attack on Syria is unrelated to human rights, justice, or any of the high-sounding causes with which the West cloaks its criminality. Perhaps the purpose of the wars is to radicalize Muslims and thereby this destabilized Russia and even China. Russia has large populations of Muslims and is bordered by Muslim countries. Even China has some Muslim population. Another advantage of the radicalization of Muslims is that it leaves former Muslim countries in long-term long turmoil or civil wars as is currently the case in Iraq and Libya, thus removing any organized state power from obstructing Israeli objectives of expansion. Secretary of State John Kerry is working the phones using bribes and threats to build acceptance, if not support, for Washington's war crime in the making against Syria. Washington is driving the world closer to nuclear war than it ever was in even in the most dangerous periods of the Cold War. When Washington finishes with Syria, the next target is Iran. 
Russia and, and China will no longer be able to fool themselves that there is any system of international law or restraint on Western criminality. Western aggression is already forcing Russia and China to develop their strategic nuclear forces and to curtail the Western financed NGOs that pose as human rights organizations, but in reality comprise a fifth column that Washington, Washington can use to destroy legitimacy of the Russian and Chinese governments. American foreign policy elites <coughs> persist in thinking that it is up to them to dictate Syria's future and with it the future of the Middle East. It seems the United States no longer does diplomacy. Everything it does has to lead to surrender or bombing. The State Department repeats what we have heard about Saddam and Gaddafi. He is killing his own people. Just like Congressman Adam Schiff, who says on a regular basis exactly that. This outlook is epitomized by Obama's August 2011 declaration that Syrian President Bashar al-Assad must go. All that this strategy has accomplished or can accomplish is to prolong bloodshed in Syria and to bolster the strength of Al-Qaeda like jihadi elements across the Middle East. Moreover, by staking out a maximalized demand for Assad's, re Assad's removal, Obama fundamentally undercut the prospects for seriously pursuing a negotiated settlement in Syria. Even by recent American standards, this, set, this sets a new standard for destructively dysfunctional policy making toward the Middle East. In Syria, it's not really a Sunni Shi divide. It's more a divide between those who want to live in a nominally secular state and those who want to live in a Sunni Islamist state. Today, Syria is in ruins. It joins Afghanistan and Iraq, who also defied the will of the United States and paid the price. Three years into the war, the Assad, the Assad government appears to be slowly winning the conflict aided by Iran, Russia, and to a modest degree, Hezbollah. But as we lament, the plight of, this, of Syria's 9 million internal and external refugees, let's remember that this brutal war was begun by the Western powers and Saudis, is financed by them and could be stopped at any time if Washington and Riyadh give the order. The United States showed its frustration with the war it began, but cannot win by just breaking diplomatic relations with Syria, which they did recently, a low IQ act that is totally counterproductive and often indicates war is imminent. Israel and its US supporters are determined to crush Assad's regime as the first step in overthrowing Iran. Given the failure of the anti-Assad rent and jihadis, Israel may soon intervene to destroy Assad's air force and armored formations. Israel is getting ready to massively attack Hezbollah in Lebanon in yet another attempt to eradicate the Shia resistant movement. What happens next? Assad will continue to strengthen his position on the ground. But as long as Saudi money and weapons get to the opposition groups, they will be able to continue a campaign and so the violence will go on. The only way out is diplomacy aimed at political settlement between Assad and the opposition. Until the Obama administration is willing to walk back from some of the positions it has taken 
regarding Assad and, with, and is willing to push allies like Saudi Arabia to hold the flow of weapons to oppositionists, it will be difficult to get a serious political process going. In the absence of a serious political process, the violence could go on for a very long time. In the upcoming July 17th presidential elections in Syria, let the people of Syria decide and choose who the president of their country should be. Foreign intervention of any kind should be avoided for the sake of democracy and human rights. The West has many more targets worldwide other than Syria. Assad is only one small part of West's big game. Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Apo Jubarian. I'm the executive publisher and managing editor of uh, USA Armenia Life magazine. Uh, I'd like to uh, call ourselves friends of fair foreign U.S. policy in Middle East and much of the world. Uh, you know, as, as a member of the activist community at the beginning of the Syrian uh, uh, crisis, I was, and I continue to be, neutral on the issue if Assad should stay or go, uh, and uh, if, if uh, uh, the Syrian people have, uh, the opposition uh, has legitimate uh, right to pursue freedom and democracy. So, uh, uh, however, as time went by, like uh, I, I, I was very neutral at the beginning, as time went by, I noticed red flags going, on, uh, going up about a revolution, uh, about demands for democracy and uh, uh, freedoms, when it turned into a, a full-fledged uh, civil war uh, aiming at getting rid of Assad government at all costs. So the second uh, flag was that uh, it wasn't too long when uh, uh, the uh, Syrian opposition's fight for freedom and democracy was hijacked by the extremist, foreign uh, extremist uh, terrorists in Syria. And the third uh, flag was as time progressed, the ranks of the main opposition of Free Syrian Army uh, increasingly depleted and it was repopulated by foreign terrorists in Syria. So th let this be a working uh, work, uh, workshop for all of us to come up with uh, uh, strategic thinking and uh, uh, this segment that is devoted for question and answer, uh, I'd like to point out that uh, the, the segment that's left only like five minutes won't do justice for uh, numerous uh, questions and uh, remarks. So I'd like to uh, invite and encourage many of you to send in your uh, questions via email uh, to aa 4 syria at yahoo.com. A and then letter A, uh, number 4, Syria at yahoo.com. So uh, uh, at this time, whoever has a question or uh, remarks, I'd like to uh, encourage you to uh, uh, come, uh, you know, to express yourselves. And the time, uh, the, the allocated time, would be no more than one minute. And the response, if there is a need for response, no more than one minute. So, uh, if any, if any one of you has a question, please uh, raise your hands, and the microphone will uh, be provided to you. I don't need a microphone. Okay. Do you believe that if we get rid of Israel? Okay, the question is, do you believe uh, if uh, the gentleman asked if we get, of, uh, get rid of uh, Israel, the, the, uh, the region would have uh, any kind of uh, peace? Mm -hmm. Who would like to respond? In better situation, would it be in better situation? Yeah. Uh, Definitely we feel that way. The axis of evil that we consider to be in the region is Saudi Arabia, Qatar and Israel and Turkey of course, along with the colonial power of France and Britain and the United States. Um, 
you know, we know that everything that Syria is going through is today is because of its stance against uh, the Israeli occupation and the, uh, you know, the occupation of the South Lebanon and the, the Palestine. Um, until uh, real justice or real peace is uh, given in the area, a fair peace, um, you know, between a two-state solution or otherwise, I don't think the Syrian government or the Syrian people will ever accept a one-sided peace. And they will continue to resist the Israeli occupation and will continue to support the Palestinian resistance and Lebanese resistance until total, you know, either freeing of the land and getting of Israel or a peaceful uh, solution. Thank you. Any other uh, member of the audience would like? Yes, please. I heard a couple of times on stage the word civil war used in regards to what's going on in Syria. In my mind, a civil war is when two factions of the given country fight each other. We all know that this Syria has been invaded from outside. Why do we call it civil war? Let's call it the invasion of Syria. So I agree, I can agree with you all, sir. In my articles, I've been repeatedly and continuously mentioning the fact that it's a foreign imposed uh, war on Syria and Syria's sovereignty as, a, as an independent state. Las Vegas, 75 miles 
of them and sending them to Syria. 700 of them are being killed. I would like to ask every, every individual, please, that if any other country would have done such a thing, what US and British are, would have done there. Let's question ourselves, and they call it, we have democracy. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Ara Manukian for uh, uh, preparing this excellent documentary that we saw tonight. Thank you, Ara. Uh, uh, yes, uh, I'd, I'd like to pass on the microphone to Ara. Quick yes. question. Um, unfortunately, due to a lack of time, we don't have time for any more questions because we have to vacate here in five minutes. And the reason why we invited you all here was not only to um, present you with documents, but also to talk about what we can do as individuals to make a difference. Because it seems as though the majority of US citizens are very indifferent to US foreign policy and what Washington does in our name. So there's a sheet that was passed around. It's a single sheet. And it's titled at the top, uh, Community Action Planning. And there's a quote at the bottom, which uh, I want to share with you, which says, one person can make a difference, and everyone should try. That was John F. Kennedy. And this is what we all have to do. Um, first of all, we've started a website. It hasn't been officially launched yet. It's called www.nobombsforsyria.com. And on there you'll find tonight's presentation and the videos and everything. But I just want to go down this list very quick because we have very little time. So what can you do as an individual to make a difference, to make your voice heard? Well, first of all, let's establish something, and we have to agree on this. What we've seen tonight with all the evidence presented, with all the statements made, our government does not represent us as it should. It doesn't correspond with our values, our core values. It doesn't correspond with what we're told America is based on and is formed on and was, was created by justice for all, my country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, it's not. So today, from this point forward, we all have to take a stance. We have no choice. If we are indifferent, we get as much as we put in. If we put nothing in, we get nothing back. So let's go over this list really quick. As far as our No Bombs for Syria campaign and what we can do for No Bombs for Syria. The first thing on here is contact. Uh, this is write, contact your, your Congress representative. And this is to write, call, and visit. They love it when you visit. Um, so we've done that, and we haven't had the results we want, but this is something I strongly encourage. You can find your Congress uh, representative on the internet. We'll have it on our site, so you can actually click on it and figure out which district is, is yours. Uh, spread the news to friends, families, colleagues, associates. And you can do this. We're planning on launching a campaign. These signs that you see that say No Bombs for Syria, we're planning on actually making available and people can purchase online flags garden flags, posters, flyers, bumper stickers, t-shirts, coffee mugs, and so on. So people will see this message, no bombs for Syria, and we'll be able to go to a website and ask, what is this? We also are planning on hopefully having billboards and bus benches. Uh, we need people that can have media contacts for public service announcements. Social media can play a big role. They said, I remember Johnny one time talking about the Syrian revolution started in a Facebook page. It didn't even exist, the, the problems, but they started on a Facebook page. We can do the same, but we really have a type of revolution, a social revolution that we have to take forward to regain our country and how it represents us today. Um, Mass emailings, everybody has emails, so you can send the information out. And telephone calls, tell your friends about it. I also strongly encourage you, we have a sign-up sign up sheet here, volunteer, um, just for even if it's one action that you get involved with, whether that be um, speaking to a community group, uh, collect petition signatures, express your thoughts through peaceful <coughs> protests and demonstrations, we do that quite a bit, um, probably not as much as we should, and uh, help raise funds. And other than that, just to wrap this up, visit our website, which will soon be launched, which is uh, nobombsforsyria.com, and that's the number four. 
And last but not least, um, there is going to be a protest tomorrow. So here's an opportunity for everybody to participate. And this is against CNN and the, the media and how they aren't representing the truth. And it will be held at 6430 Sunset Boulevard tomorrow, April 19th, starting at 2 o'clock. And bring signs. So if you have signs, bring signs. If anybody needs the, the 12 by 18 signs we have of the no bombs for Syria, please feel free to take them with you if you're planning on going to this protest tomorrow. And other than that, again, our country has to represent us and what we really, truly believe in. And Washington, especially in respect to uh, U.S. foreign policy, is doing the exact opposite of what we would do otherwise. Thank you.